and we will make sure that we hold people accountable who decide to come here. Law and order at VSO, Sheriff Gregory Tony starts his second year as Broward's top cop. He is with us live for a look back and forward. Hi, I'm Rick Scott. As you may have heard, I've been taken hostage along with 99 other people in the U.S. Capitol. Bad joke. Rick Scott complains he's being held hostage at the impeachment trial and it sets off a furious backlash. What was he thinking? We'll take it to the round table. Every public official that I know believes that his election is in the public interest. Free reign for the president. Attorney Alan Dershowitz says the president can pretty much do whatever he pleases and the GOP senators appear to go along. We will take that to the round table. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. Glenna is on assignment in Iowa. We will hear from her in just a minute. The caucuses, as you know, are happening tomorrow night. The first votes to be cast in the 2020 election cycle. And so much is riding on the results. Whoever wins in Iowa is going to have momentum going into New Hampshire, which is just eight days later, followed by primaries in Nevada and South Carolina. Florida, as you know, does not vote until March 17th. But right now, all eyes are on Iowa and what is going to happen at the caucuses tomorrow night. Will it be Bernie or Biden or Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar? Mike Bloomberg is not on the ballot there or on any ballot until Super Tuesday, March 3rd. But right now, it's all about Iowa. So let's go to live in Des Moines, where our friend, colleague, and co-moderator of this show, Glenna Milberg, standing by live. Glenna, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, beautiful day here in Des Moines and throughout Iowa. I think we even break 40 here today. So the final arguments already underway today, the last day that the candidates can really get out, get on the road, crisscross the state, getting that last minute FaceTime today, and they are all doing that. The message though, Michael, really interesting. All week it's been about policy and their ideas. Today, it's all about the passion. Candidates really need to get Iowans out to the caucus precincts tomorrow night. Yes, we can win in the general election statewide in the state of Iowa. Of course we can do that. Of course we can do that. Saturday night in Des Moines, Amy Klobuchar packed the house. Across town with Andrew Yang, standing room only. When I say show up, you say for Yang, show up. For Yang. Those were the latest in a dizzying schedule of appearances and events the all the Democratic the candidates have been making in cities and counties around cold, snow covered Iowa these last days, making plays for those headed to caucus Monday night. I think it actually sets the tone, possibly, for the election going forward and gets people interested and so forth and say, oh, so they just take a second look. Thank you. Joe Biden protecting his ground in a statistical tie with Bernie Sanders, who, like 2016, is rocking the youngest voters with promises of social revolution. Pete Buttigieg, an unknown, and now, now top contender, and courting and disaffected Republicans. Elizabeth Warren, down in the polls, Governor. campaigning as a unifier. <laughs> Tomorrow night begins with caucus goers clustering together for their candidates. If one does not receive 15% of the room threshold, that candidate is no longer viable there, and those caucus supporters realign to support another. Second and third choices are important here. Look for how caucus goers break for the progressive change candidates, familiars stay the course moderates, or bridge building political newcomers. Just to be right in the middle of it and just have that opportunity where all the politicians are gathered and you can really be immersed in, in that information. And immersed in an advertising onslaught. Billboards, yard signs, door hangers, and no Iowan can watch but a few minutes of television without a front row seat to an on-air ad war. $11.3 million are being injected into our local economy because of the Iowa caucuses. That's significant. Relatively small state with outsized importance because of this position as the first vote in the presidential season. The issues here to caucus goers, you're very familiar with things like health care, uh, climate crisis, education, all of those things. 
But all of the Democratic caucus goers we've been talking to have this one overarching issue that they're going in with, and that is to pick a candidate that in November will be able to beat Donald Trump. And Michael, what is really interesting to think about is just four years ago here in Iowa in the GOP uh, caucusing, Donald Trump came in second, and that was really the nation's first look at what kind of power and pull Donald Trump would have. A powerful figure, no doubt. Uh, Glenna, how many Iowans do they estimate are going to go and caucus tomorrow night? You know, Michael, I don't have a number, but they do think the turnout is going to exceed the largest turnout ever here, which was 2008. Barack Obama was on that uh, on that ticket. So they are expecting a really huge, possibly precedent setting turnout. Uh, we've been seeing anecdotally that that is the case. People here are so engaged and to be able to caucus, which is not going into a, a voting booth and, and checking off or bubbling in a dot. It's actually going in and, and arguing and debating and persuading the people around you to come and support your candidate. And so to do that, the people here are really engaged in the issues, very knowledgeable about their candidate. And it's kind of like, you know, true democracy in the making. Uh, a caucus is unlike any other kind of thing I have seen, except maybe a Vermont uh, town meeting. It's very unusual. Uh, Glenna, there is some breaking news out of Des Moines this morning. The Des Moines Register, which is the most powerful, influential voice in the state of Iowa, normally publishes its poll on the Sunday before the caucuses, but they didn't publish their poll. Why not? Do you know? They didn't. And yes, and actually this here broke last night, really kind of stunning people. Des Moines Register went last night and, and sort of reported that there was an issue with a respondent to the poll who claimed that there was an issue with not all the candidates being on the ballot. That was, I hear, coming through the Pete Buttigieg campaign. A campaign staffer kind of raised a lot of issues with the Des Moines Register and in an abundance of caution, because it is such a highly respected poll, in an abundance of caution decided to pull the poll and not publish the results. Uh, that kind of had a cascading effect as well because the poll was also a, a Des Moines Register CNN poll. Mm -hmm. CNN had planned an entire program last night around the result of that poll, and all of a sudden they had to find something to fill that hour. So that was kind of stunning the the people on the on the ground here and all of the candidates' ground games. They were expecting something in hand to sort of take and spin and sell for themselves. I don't know for the caucus goer here if that was as big of a deal this time as it is to insiders here. Our Glenn and Milberg live in a balmy Des Moines, 40 degrees, my goodness. Glad it's uh, <laughs> not freezing the way it usually is. Glenn, we're glad you're there. We will look forward to your reports. All right, up next, Broward County Sheriff Gregory Tony starting his second year as Broward's top cop. He wants to keep that job, and he is with us live. That's next. The Broward Sheriff's Office is a big, complicated operation. It encompasses 5,600 employees. Nearly 1,600 of them are sworn deputies. Then there are more than 700 firefighters, more than 1,000 corrections officers, plus about 2,200 civilian support staff, a small army of people, and it certainly costs a lot to run. $963 million for this year. It is the largest part of the Broward County budget. At the top of the BSO ch chain of command is Sheriff Gregory Tony, appointed sheriff by the governor 13 months ago. He has made some key changes in department policies and staffing since he has been in sh charge. Sheriff, good morning. Great to have you. Good come morning, in. Michael. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, well, we said we would do it, and here we're doing it. All right, so it's been 13 months. Uh, I think there's been a steep learning curve by all accounts. You have been moving up the curve. Give yourself a grade. How do you think you're doing? Gosh, I, I will tell you, if I start grading myself, mm -hmm. I am destined for failure. Uh, what I would say is we, as an organization with the current command staff we have in place, have had an enormous amount of success in terms of changing the direction of the ship, safeguarding this community, introducing new policies, equipment, training, things that are essential so that we never again face what we face 
uh, and Stoneman Douglas are at the airport. Right. So you do have a new training facility that you have opened. Tell us a little bit about that. Correct. So one of the key things uh, that I found that was going to be important for us to su sustain all the new training we were implementing, because now we have all the top credentials in the United States in terms of active shooter preparedness and response protocols. But in, for, in order for us to continue that type of annual training, not every three years, every four years, but annual training, we needed our training center. The agency's been around for 105 years, and this right. past December is the first time that we broke ground on what's roughly a 90,000 square foot facility. All of our different uh, departments and units that you mentioned from detention to fire rescue mm -hmm. to law enforcement will be housed and trained inside of the site location. Yeah, well that is an advancement. Now tell us, what about the, the policy, the key policy that came under such huge criticism uh, after the Stoneman Douglas massacre, which is a officer who arrives at a scene like that, a mass shooting, shall enter the property instead of may enter? I mean, have you changed that? Absolutely. Look, the policies are, that are mandating that our deputies arrive on these scenes immediately and make entry. That's not just a policy aspect for the agency, but that is kind of the standard national protocol. I can tell you having been a nationally certified active shooter threat instructor, trained across the country, FBI agents, local municipalities, we do not train law enforcement or our fire rescue personnel to stand idly by when people are being right. slaughtered. Right. Sheriff Tony, there have been on your watch a number of kind of ugly, unfortunate incidents, and you have sort of approached them, attacked them head on, and taken action on them. Uh, this includes this deputy, Jorge Sabrino, punched a guy who was hospitalized, you know, chained, handcuffed to a gurney in a hospital. You fired him pretty quickly. Another 19-year-old deputy at the sheriff hit a handcuffed man being processed. The most high-profile incident, uh, obviously, I think, was this uh, Doran Roll, then a 15-year-old teenager uh, in Tamarack, and a couple of officers, well, first he was pepper sprayed, and then he was pushed to, you know, taken to the ground, and one officer, Richard uh, Christopher Krikovich, mm -hmm. uh, sort of ground his face into the pavement, and... Um, uh, you eventually took action, you know, and disciplined him. Tell me about what you did. Yeah, you know, Michael, you just highlighted several different incidents that transpired uh, during my first year. Uh, and I have taken a very aggressive stand in holding people accountable and making sure that we are transparent with the public. We are already, or coming into the agency, we had already lost the trust of the public because of a, a horrific tragedy right. related to whether or not our officers and law enforcement personnel would do their job and safeguard this community when someone's killing our kids. And then now we have another cultural change that I had to take on about making sure that when we step out of line that we are able to police ourselves. And it hasn't been popular at times. I had to go against our professional standards committee uh, and where they recommended uh, one case of exoneration related right. to the DeLuca right. case. Uh, they recommended just a few days suspension for uh, Sabrina who was striking an individual in handcuffs. And that is not the culture, that is not the style of law enforcement uh, in which I'm going to lead this organization. We will be accountable. So you sent a message to, among others, the deputies union, which tried to defend. It is their role to try to defend a police officer who's accused of excessive force or something else. But you were sending them a message. We will not accept this. Here's the thing. Uh, the union presidents, their responsibility is to safeguard the rights of the law enforcement officers which they represent. But the manner in how you do it, how you present it, I think there's been a loss of focus that if you fight too hard, if you can't look at the things that are just factual, mm -hmm. that are wrong, and you go to the defense of those things, you lose the public trust. Yep. And so as the chief law enforcement officer for this agency, I have to do the balancing act of making sure I hold my men accountable and that the public yep. understands that we will self-police when it's time. Sheriff, how many of your deputies are wearing body cams? Must they have the cameras on all the time? How are they, how is, are those tapes reviewed? Tell us a little bit about so, that. So, yeah, the body-worn camera system was enacted before I came into office. It's a great system. It serves two purposes, right? It gives us an opportunity to examine every aspect that occurs in the field. So when our deputies go on the calls, we have policies in place that requires them to activate the camera system while they're investigating, while they're engaged with the community, and it gives us a full-spectrum picture of what would occur from that time. When we look at this from an investigative standpoint, should there be a complaint that comes in, mm -hmm. we pull all the video, not just of the deputy that may have the encounter, yeah. but in all the deputies well. surrounding the area. Yeah. Yes, and it's been a beneficial tool. Yeah, well, and in addition to the body cam video, 
uh, everybody's got a cell phone, and you yes. can record video on cell phones. I happen to think that this is probably the biggest change in law enforcement, you know, in our lifetime is the fact that people who some of whom are people of color have complained about mistreatment, you know, sure. now there is video that will either prove it or at least raise questions and, about it. And oftentimes with the cameras and the video that we're getting, it's always at the back end of an altercation, meaning right. the public shows up at the end of a traffic stop where perhaps a law enforcement officer had already pulled somebody out the ground and they're seeing the tail end of it. So. It's a benefit to have our body-worn cameras that show the whole picture that can supplement whatever videos that we get from the public. But at the end of the day, it's not just a matter of the videos. It's looking at whether or not we're in compliance with policy, right. where we're doing things that were reasonable and necessary in proportion to the threat that we dealt with. Right. Um, I want to ask you briefly about the Martin Luther King holiday, the so-called ride out, where a couple of hundred uh, hooligans, in my view, you know, get on the road, scare the heck out of people who are driving down the street. Now, your deputies this year, under your direction, uh, were very proactive, uh, but really after the fact. Do you need stronger laws to be able to go in when they arrive in town or they come out on their bikes? Listen, I agree with your sentiments. Every single year we have this um, event that takes place, an, an unsanctioned event that takes place where the activities of these men and women riding these ATVs are putting our residents in harm's way. Right. They, they're overlooking any type of law that exists. And so what I would like to see happen, uh, to your point, we are reactive. We're waiting for it to happen every year. It's perhaps we introduce something, in, whether it be a county ordinance or work with our legislators to have much more punitive things in place where it gives us more authority to act before things start to go wrong on the streets. Yeah. Uh, you are on the ballot uh, for the August uh, primary election. And look, frankly, we all know Broward is a predominantly Democratic county. So whoever wins the August primary is essentially going to be the sheriff of Broward County. Correct. Uh, Scott Israel, your predecessor, is running. Why should people vote for you? Michael, I think uh, the voter base here in Broward County needs to be educated and understand the importance of this role not being a political role. It's an elected role. The public gets mm -hmm. to choose. But what this agency has lacked for quite some time is a professional law enforcement officer who is focused on public safety. Yeah. Using was Israel too political? Absolutely. It was too political. And if you look at how the agency was managed, the public safety aspect came second. It can't work that way. There can't be an agenda to focus on winning the election based on how you manipulate voters, uh, how you uh, use certain funds to you know, yeah. benefit yourself. I came in this agency within a year and reallocated over $60 million building out a real-time crime center, a training center, putting forth the best active shooter training protocols, building out an office and you of emergency promoted, management. you promoted a black woman to the highest rank uh, in their department. And, and I'll share more about that because it wasn't a matter of just promoting um, the first African-American undersheriff, but for the first time in this agency's history, the entire command staff is comprised of BSO employees who have served this agency. I didn't bring in 30, 40 friends from another agency, yeah. and that's why we're having a success. Yeah. Sheriff Gregory Tony, it's always good to speak with you, and uh, before August, we'll have you back in a debate with maybe Scott Israel. I, I would hope that we can organize that. I think the public benefits by hearing the truth. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Sheriff. Sir. Thanks very much. All right, stay with us. Up next, we're going to take this week's Hot Topics to the Roundtable. So much news this week, a tsunami of information, so we want to kind of refine our search, take a closer look now at some of the top stories with our Powerhouse Roundtable. We've got a good one. Stephen Johnson chairs the Miami-Dade County Black Affairs Advisory Board. He's an attorney with the Lidecker Diaz firm in Miami. Mark Caputo is a Miami-based reporter for Politico, covering the 2020 presidential race with an emphasis on Florida, he is an alumnus of the Miami Herald, SMI. Bernadette Norris Weeks is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale with the law firm of Austin Pamies Norris Weeks. She is the founder of the Women of Color Empowerment Institute. And we are glad to welcome back an old friend, Steve Bosquet, columnist and editorial contributor now to the Sun Sentinel, longtime Tallahassee reporter for the Tampa Bay Times, and even worked once many years ago at Channel 10. Absolutely. Good I'm an alum. It's good to be good, back. Good, morning. good to have you come good back. Good afternoon. 
Stephen, let's begin. Oh. I mean, it is Super Bowl Sunday. Don't want to sound like the Chamber of Commerce, but thank goodness the day is beautiful. If you are in Bangor, Maine and watching this, you could say, boy, that Miami looks like a cool place. But let's talk about money, because this is costing Miami-Dade taxpayers, according to the Miami Herald, in the vicinity of $20 million. So are we getting a return on investment? Let's talk about those returns, and let's talk specifically about the returns we're getting directly from the NFL. It's my understanding they've put in about $2.5 million to refurbish a few uh, yeah. uh, fields. However, they've done nothing in Miami Gardens, and that is the whole city. That is the city that is hosting the right. Super Bowl. And I've come to learn that uh, while Miami Gardens coordinated its own event in order to try to draw people to right. its city, the NFL blocked some of the uh, vendors, some of the sponsors, rather, hmm. so to undercut the events that we are having. Yeah. So the question is, and I want to have more Super Bowls, is whether or not as we're a good host for them, whether or not they're a good guest for us. That's, that's the real issue for me. Yeah, but Steve, I think, you know, like the ad says, sometimes the value of something is priceless. And I oh. think that the, well, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Hold on, Mark, you'll sorry. get. All right, so the beauty shots, jump in here. The beauty shots that are shown between quarters or when they go to commercials that show the skyline, that show Biscayne Bay, you know, that show South Beach. I mean, those things have real value. They sure have real value, but they don't have real value to me as a Miami-Dade taxpayer to spend, well, let's say 20 minus 2.5 is 17.5 right. million in corporate welfare, right. including putting up million dollar millionaire athletes in swank hotel rooms. Who doesn't know that Miami is nice in the winter? Yeah. Rodney uh, Barreto, who runs the host committee for the Super yeah. Bowl, is quoted in the Herald as saying something like, if we don't do this, Another city will great, and th right when this gets to the heart of the <laughs> this gets to the heart of the issue. This this yeah. this constant uh, bidding war among cities to host a Super Bowl. This is a novel concept to the NFL, I'm sure, but it's it feels like the NFL should be paying Miami for the privilege of playing the game down here. Well, I take a slightly different view. I think this is a part of doing business. I think that this is what we can expect when we have a Super Bowl. I do agree with Stephen with Miami Gardens, not really yeah. getting it. Nobody mentions the Super Bowl is being held in Miami Gardens. Hello, people. Right. <laughs> so that is a, a really big deal. But I think um, in terms of bidding for this, all cities have to absorb some cost of it, and that's just yeah, but I, I have But I have to agree with Mark on one thing, the fact that you've got millionaire athletes who are staying at Turnberry Resort and then at, uh, I think, uh, the Marriott Marquis downtown. I mean, really beautiful hotels. And we're paying a million dollars for them to stay in those in, hotels. In a city with, uh, in, a, in a region with a huge affordable housing crisis. Right. It's almost a sick irony, really. Isn't yeah, it? and it's just like we are, we are, yeah, we're in a bidding war, but we're in a bidding war to be both the prostitute and the john at the same time. Right. And the uh, NFL is the pimp. Well, look at all Whoa. of the, look at all of the business that um, we are receiving you know, our hotels are packed, our, our businesses um, mm -hmm. in certain areas are packed. Um, so there are benefits, we can't, they're undeniable. But, um, but I think that mo when they come back again, and, and hopefully they do, I yeah. think more focus needs to be given to I'll, cities like Miami Gardens and how to improve. Agree. I will right say there. that at least one city, North Miami, took the opportunity to redo a vacant lot and through an event uh, this entire weekend. So they are bringing people right. to their city through their own entre entrepreneurial uh, efforts, and I do uh, credit that. Miami Gardens is doing the same thing today, and I think everybody needs to know about that. Cities are going to have to work with and around the, the Super and Bowl. The and the NFL, NFL is going to have to be more cooperative with those cities, and it's not been, as you say, with, uh, uh, with uh, Miami Gardens. You know, I do say I saw this morning a Pricewaterhouse Coopers estimates that uh, $218 million is going to be spent in the local economy Who paid by for people. that study? You know? <laughs> Who uh, paid for it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I would imagine it's uh, a, a group or entity affiliated with or aligned and yeah. or adjacent to the interests that want the Super Bowl here yeah. and have cut them a deal where, for instance, in Miami Beach, they were supposed to have an event. NFL pulled the rug out from under them there as well. Yeah. So uh, the deal just doesn't seem very good. And I do wonder what effect uh, the residents of Miami Gardens' opposition to F1 racing has oh, had yeah. on the NFL doing things in and around Miami yeah, Gardens. And also, I wonder if Stephen Ross is that petty. I also have to wonder about the propriety, even though there's nothing illegal, 
How about Mayor Jimenez, who is a supporter of the Formula One racing, taking tickets worth $8,000 right. from Stephen Ross. Uh, he'll report them, so it's not as if it's under the table, but there's something and there his, that... His <clears throat> son is a lobbyist for... And his son is a lobbyist. That, that, yeah. Have fun in your re-election or your election campaign against Debbie McCarcel Powell. That's going to be a difficult one for Mayor Jimenez. Yeah. But at least he gets to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we want to talk about the fact that for the first time ever, political ads for Mike Bloomberg and President Trump are going to be run during the Super Bowl. We'll take a look at those when we come back. Welcome back. We are just uh, getting going here with our roundtable on the Super Bowl Sunday. And as I said before the break, uh, for the first time ever, politicians are running ads during the Super Bowl costing them $11 million for 60 seconds. And here's a little background on the ads. America demanded change. Donald Trump wins the presidency. And change is what we got. The Trump ad is professional America and is somewhat stronger, predictable safer, in praise of Trump. Under President Trump, America is stronger, safer, and more prosperous than ever before. It's Trump's greatest hits in 30 seconds. A similar ad will also air, but we won't see it till game time. Ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come. A Trump campaign spokesman says, we got in early, which gave us a prime ad position early in the game. Early guarantees a bigger audience. Viewers may tune out if the game is one-sided. George started playing football when he was four years old. Mike Bloomberg has already spent $250 million of his own dollars on TV and digital ads, many attacking Trump directly. On a Friday morning, George was shot. George didn't survive. But Bloomberg's Super Bowl ad doesn't mention Donald Trump. It's all about preventing gun violence. It is a national crisis. The ad features Calandrian Simpson Kemp, whose 20-year-old son was shot to death in 2013, one of many victims of gun violence. I know Mike is not afraid of the gun lobby. They're scared of him, and they should be. Well, I find those ads very interesting, although Mark Caputo, as I said, the, the Trump ad is sort of, it's very well done, but it's predictable, his greatest hits, his accomplishments. The Bloomberg ad, on the other hand, you know, to talk about gun violence. Great in uh, the Democratic primary. Is. Because um, he's, you remember, Bloomberg in the end is running in a Democratic primary. For right. Us. And Trump's ad is effective because Trump is so bad at staying on message. And that's right. such a good ad to say, hey, here's what his message should be. So I think both of them are pretty good. Right. And he's, st he's still introducing himself to a lot of people, Bloomberg is. You know, I think Bloomberg is going to surprise a lot of people in Florida. Obviously, it's a long way between now and March 17th. Right. Uh, but but Bloomberg is a known factor here, uh, being Jewish, the New York connection, mm -hmm. and the, the, the fact that he's a self-funder, I think, cuts both ways. We've had bad experience in Florida with a self-funder. <laughs> uh, does the name Rick Scott Rick ring Scott. a bell? You know? <laughs> uh, but, but I think Bloomberg should address that issue head on at some point. You know? well, the, fact, the fact that he is skipping basically the first three um, states. First four. First four. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's got to come, he's got to really come hard in Florida and, yeah. and places like it, and especially with Florida being a swing state. And the thing about um, Bloomberg is this, he's not scary like a Bernie Sanders type of candidate where it's Bernie or bust. Mm -hmm. You know, people know that he's already committed to um, uh, dedicating his staff through November. And, and so it feels, you know, it feels like... Not he, just it's staff, a, yeah. but money. It, and money. He it says he's going to spend so millions. So it's a win-win, whether it's Biden or Bloomberg, it's, it's good for Florida. It's legitimate, and I love the fact that he's opening his campaign to the nation with an African-American mother talking about her child, right? That's mm -hmm. what this issue is about. It's not about crime per se. Right. It's about protecting our children, and it's about reaching out to what important demographic mm -hmm. is that? women voters, right? It is very, very smart. It shows an openness and a willingness to be sophisticated yeah. about this. I love it. Yeah, well, there are going to be 100 million people who are going to be watching the Super Bowl. And, you know, Bernadette, I've got to say, there may be some people, you know, dedicated football fans for this iconic event who are going to say, leave me alone. I don't want to see any politics on a Super Bowl. 
Mark is making a face here. <laughs> I, think, I think people expect it. You know, the Super Bowl, you can expect anything. It's a smart move. It, you can tune in and, 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 and get people that would normally just turn the ch channel. Yeah. But on Super Bowl day, um, it, it's just a smart buy, and people will expect it. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of white Super Bowl watchers, a lot of white TV watchers, a lot of white football fans don't want to hear problems in the black community, even though most of the players in the field are black. Yeah. So, you know, it's just one of those things. So when Colin Kaepernick, for instance, uh, made his protest known, the amount of displeasure that a lot of these white fans expressed toward him without actually thinking, you know what, maybe black people shouldn't be stopped randomly, beaten and shot and killed by police. Yeah. Uh, it's, well, it, stopped it, and frisked is the issue with Bloomberg rather yeah. than the more violent Correct. No, I was just talking about the broader issue of, of yeah. people expressing displeasure that there's politics on their TV. Oh, so, oh no. Yeah. But well. even the stop and frisk issue, if you stop and really think about it, it says the same thing. At the end of the day, we just want little brown children to be able to go to the library safely, yeah. right? Go to the playground safely. We want to stop violence in the community. Was it, was it executed properly? No. But at the end of the day, at least somebody's going to take some step to do something to stop violence in the community. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. And, and more than black people care about crime and children it, going right, to school course. safely. So it's not just a black issue. Right. Gun violence, and look at the Parkland shooting right here in um, South right. Florida. Right. It's not just a black issue. Right. It's a it's a an American. It's an American issue. issue. But Bloomberg does have a, a, a potential problem with African American voters. Every one of them has a potential problem Except for with Joe Biden. Yeah. Except for Joe Biden. Biden. Biden right. Joe Biden right has a ninety three ninety two crime bill. Do not sit here and tell me that he doesn't have a problem with black voters. He absolutely I, I, I don't think he does. Do. I don't think he does. He does. At if least you, here, if, at you least talk, talk, if you talk to it's not about Florida though. We gotta we gotta look at the nation, right? If you talk to those uh, young people, it's funny. My mother, Biden supporter. People My nephew is a Bernie supporter. Bernie's the only one, although he has people, a George Washington problem. People care problem. about electability. Not, and, and, not our and, kids. And folks, especially a lot of black people that I talk to, they see Biden as the person who is electable and most electable. And, and that's and, my and mother's they're going to ride view. that horse and all in, the way to And in South Carolina, it appears Biden is going to sweep the black vote exactly. in, in South will. Carolina. He absolutely will. He better because, because there's going to be a lot of national TV correspondents standing in the snow or whatever there is in New Hampshire <laughs> on the morning after the New Hampshire primary prematurely announcing Joe Biden's well, obituary. I'm not one uh, of those folks, but I will be writing that if the candidate of electability begins losing elections, it makes his message more complicated. And let me point yeah. this out. Uh, Barack Obama won two elections, and he didn't just do it with the black vote. If we're going to beat Donald Trump, we're going to need everybody in that tent, everybody in that tent, and committed to that idea. And if you're only going based upon your record as Barack Obama's vice president, which is all I've really and heard I don't right think now. that's what he's doing, in uh, fairness what's, to what's, him. He, what's his message? His message, if, if people listen, and I don't think they're listening right now, is everything that we care about. It's health care and, and, um, and, and issues of crime. He's talking about crime. He's Bernie's talking about child care. care. Restore he's the talking soul of the about, nation. He's, 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 he's talking, talking about and, and, and not Donald Trump. Uh, right, and but that that is a big deal. But I'm that's not Donald Trump. Well, I'm and that's not what Donald Trump care about. Is the default setting, right? It's like, okay, we expect none of you to be Donald Trump. Now, what are you going to do? What is your message? Yeah. How are you going to move America forward? It's going to well, be an amazing primary. It's going to be great. Can't yeah, wait. It, it will. All right, everybody, stay where you are because we're going to come back. We've got more, including a rather remarkable video from Senator Rick Scott. Back to a very robust roundtable on this Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. Steve Vasquez from the Sun Sentinel, Stephen Johnson from the Lidecker Diaz Law Firm in Miami, Bernadette Norris Weeks from the Bernadette Norris Weeks Law Firm, and Mark Caputo from Politico. Uh, let's talk a little bit about impeachment, but I really want to emphasize the role of the two Florida senators in impeachment. Both of them, of course, uh, voted not to bring in witnesses. But, uh, Mark Caputo, I thought it was interesting that this week, uh, or for the past 10 days or so, Marco Rubio has kept a very low profile. He didn't, he really seemed to be more thoughtful. And then he came, well, all right, I, you know, he was, while Rick Scott was saying, it's boring, I've heard nothing new, uh, Rubio didn't say anything. And then on Friday, here's the statement that he issued. He said, just because actions meet a standard of impeachment does not mean it is in the best interest of the country to remove a president from office. That's like an OJ, you know, if I did it thing. 
So, I mean, what he was saying, it seems to me, basically, and, and uh, Steve, jump in here, yeah. was, okay, he, the, the House managers met the level, the standard, the criteria for impeachment, but it's just not a good idea to remove him from office. No, I mean, I think he also said we're going to have an election in 10 months. Yes, he did. And so, um, you know, uh, that's taking the easy way out, of course, um, and not facing, you know, the volume of the, the weight of the, uh, the evidence against Trump. Uh, neither one of the two senators from Florida distinguished themselves here. Uh, and, and for Rick Scott to call something boring, I mean, that's, 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 <laughs> well, I, I think, that's a tautology. That's, I think if you were to poll, like, it, I, I think Senator Alexander's position would probably, my guess is, poll the best. Yeah. Where he said, look, I think he did something bad. He actually inappropriate. inappropriate. But I don't think the punishment fits the crime. Basically, right. we shouldn't cut off hands for theft is basically what he's saying. Uh, whereas Rubio was just like, well, if he did it. And then Scott was at the far end of it. All right. Well, let's, let's go to a video that uh, Senator Scott released uh, late this week. Uh, and he said some things that are kind of unbelievable. Let's run a little bit of the Scott video. Hi, I'm Rick Scott. As you may have heard, I've been taken hostage along with 99 other people in the U.S. Capitol. We are receiving only milk and water, and we are being subjected to the cruel and unusual punishment of listening to the rantings of Adam Schiff, a person from a parallel universe. Well, my goodness, Stephen, I think he thought he was being cute or making a joke, but it, it fell flat, didn't it? It did, but in our Twitter uh, 120 characters society, it, it was more of a sense of humor than I thought Rick Scott would ever display in public. The fact that he fell flat was he's not a comedian. He's not funny. Well, he's funny, but his, his delivery was off. I, I was not impressed. I had to chuckle, though, because whoever said it was a good idea for him to do it should be fired immediately. Immediately, oh. yeah. Who, who would think that's funny? Cruel and unusual punishment, that should be reserved for um, Rick Scott being the governor who um, sent more people to the death penalty um, to be executed than any other government governor. That should be reserved for um, uh, women who are trafficked. Um, they're held hostage. Uh, it, it was just a ridiculous, insensitive comment to make about something that is his responsibility as a senator to do. I, to the I monitored, the, I monitored the, the Twitter traffic and wrote about that yeah. this week, and boy, I mean, no one, almost no one that I saw saw much humor in this. I'm, really, I'm going to no. take a contrarian Fred, view. Okay, just real quick. Uh, I mean, you know, for example, Fred Gutenberg, yeah. the father of one of the Parkland victims, uh, said Scott should resign. That uh, to, to do use, his job or resign. To, yeah. Do his job or the, the, to use the word being taken hostage as a joke is not funny to a lot of people. Uh -huh. uh, Understand, this is the starting gun for 2024, folks. You have three Florida Republicans who actually might run for president. You have Rick Scott as one of them, Ron DeSantis another, and maybe even Marco Rubio. This is not about us. This is not about independent voters. It's not about Democratic voters. This is about messaging to conservatives that, hey, I am one of you. Yeah. I am behind Trump fully because this is the party yeah, of Donald but, Trump. But, but I have to say, it, it strikes me, and I've given it some thought, that Senator Scott is trying to emulate Donald Trump, you know, larger than life. I'm going to go ahead and say something here that's kind of mildly outrageous. Trump can get away with it. Rick Scott no, doesn't know how to get away with it. Funny. Because he's not funny. You see how funny. that works? You see, comedy gets you all the way to home. He's I, not funny. I will say this, uh, if, if Mark Caputo, if the goal was to get a viral video that the whole country exactly. was talking about, <laughs> well, he succeeded because yeah. we, we are saying about it. And conservatives <laughs> saw it. We and are, they like it. We are, but he's not as funny as uh, DeSantis, let's face it. He's not as funny as anybody. I mean, he's not DeSantis, as funny as DeSantis, DeSantis is a funny guy. No, no, what no, was, what's cruel and unusual is eight years of Rick Scott in the governor's yeah. mansion. Yeah. That was yeah. cruel and unusual. Yeah, you know, I would also point out, and I'm sure you reported on this, Steve, that mm. Congressman Ted Deutsch pointed out that Robert Levinson of Coral right. Springs has been a captive hostage in Iran for 13 right. years. Right. Now, he and Scott worked on that together, and he said, what are you talking about? Right, that's Bob Levinson is a real hostage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, you know, I get to the I get the point that Mark Caputo made. That this is about uh, uh, you know trying to message for 2024, uh, but uh, we're going to see this this video come back at some point. For well, sure. it will. All right, we are out of time. What a great discussion! <laughs> Thank you all for coming in. Thank you. And good luck with your teams this afternoon.
Go so, Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come, my personal perspective about that moment of madness by Governor Rick Scott. Stay with us. A personal perspective about Senator Rick Scott and an uncharacteristic and I think appalling outburst this week. Senator Scott normally is a low-keyed guy, serious, somewhat humorless, doesn't yuck it up, and yet this week he released this video in which he tries to make a joke, but boy, does it fall flat. Take a listen. Hi, I'm Rick Scott. As you may have heard, I've been taken hostage along with 99 other people in the U.S. Capitol. We are receiving only milk and water, and we are being subjected to the cruel and unusual punishment of listening to the rantings of Adam Schiff a person from a parallel universe. Oh my goodness, that is just so wrong on so many levels to call himself a hostage and say Congressman Adam Schiff is from a parallel universe. It's appalling, really. Senator Scott evidently thought he was going to make a joke. I don't hear anybody laughing. And his comments were offensive to people really involved in hostage situations like in the Parkland shootings. Jamie Gutenberg, for example, the 14-year-old Parkland girl shot to death at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High two years ago. Her father, Fred, sent out a hot tweet reminding Senator Scott that Jamie had been a real hostage and telling him to do the job he was elected to do or resign. And then Bob Levinson of Coral Springs is still a hostage in Iran, held there for the last 13 years. Well, Congressman Ted Deutsch of Boca Raton, who has worked hard to get Levinson freed and who worked with Senator Scott on it, Ted Deutsch told Scott doing the job he was elected to do does not make him a hostage. Scott's video and the accompanying tweet were the work of many hands. Wasn't there an adult in the room, someone who could look the senator in the eye and say, hey, Senator, this just goes over the line. Don't do it. Well, apparently not. I suspect that Scott was trying to emulate his friend Donald Trump, who can pull off this kind of tasteless, vulgar stuff because, well, he's Donald Trump. Rick Scott is no Donald Trump. This was just embarrassing. Senator Scott needs somebody on his staff who can tell him, no, don't do that. But he did it, and he embarrassed himself. That is our show for this week. We miss Glenna. Hope she will be back in, well, maybe not next week. She'll be in New Hampshire. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We'll see you next Sunday.